Okay, we're back. We're live. The one o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Texas Research in Manoa, where we find out what the scientists are doing up there. And uh, today we're going to talk about. Um, I call it. It's all about magnetism. Uh, research in Manoa, paleomagnetism, lessons from Earth's magnetic field, but it goes beyond that. And our, um, you know, our primary guest is uh, Dr. Emilio Herrera Bervera. Uh, and he is one of the most magnetic personalities I have ever met in geoscience. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Emilio. I am a walking magnet. <laughs> That's basically what I am, <laughs> right? If you want to define uh, magnetism in human bodies that way, yes, We're going to talk about that. Okay, next to him we have Carl uh, Ger Gernecker. Gerstnecker. Gerstnecker. No, no, Gerstnecker. Gerstnecker. Okay. No, Gerstnecker. Ger Gerstnecker. It's a mouthful. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that too. And he's a student uh, in uh, what? Um, uh, geoscience in. Yes, master student at the University of Hawaii. Master student in geoscience. Uh, you guys know each other, actually, yeah? <laughs> of course. I just yeah. want to check up on that, yeah? <laughs> so we talk about magnetism today. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing that uh, we should start with is uh, that paleomagnetism, because paleomagnetism can teach us about the past, right? And teach exactly. amazing things, not only long term things, but relatively short term things. Yes. But how do you learn about the past using magnetism? That's it sounds like a long way to go. What kind of technology actually does that? Okay, what we are actually doing is we're studying the um, the magnetic minerals in rocks, right? I'm talking about all kinds of rocks that we have in nature. So we can go from the contemporary uh, contemporary type of rocks. You know, I'm talking about lava flows that have been erupted in the past uh, few days, and then we can go back more or less to about four billion years. They are rocks that have been found, for example, in Canada, that probably they retain the original magnetism when the, the lavas, for example, were erupted. Or, this reminds me of a show we once had about computers, and we got a call from some guy, and he said, you're talking about computers, but, but I need to know about electricity. Can you tell me about electricity? So you know, I mean, it's, it's a parallel, but what is magnetism? Emilio? Basically, <laughs> it's, it's not really that simple to define that. It was um, the, the word was actually coined from the island of Magnesia, right? And started doing that kind of, you know, uh, uh, definition of it. And magnetism basically is when you have something like a, a, an object that is, could be basically a lodestone or something metallic that has two different charges, right? One positive and negative. Right, so this is basically producing what is called a magnetic moment, and it's a dipole. Right? Okay, so it has to be metallic. Uh, no, we, yeah, it, not necessarily. Right? They are can can I have thing. something that's magnetic that yeah. has no metal in it? No, yeah, they, well, it has iron and it has oxygen. Those are the ferro and ferry magnetics, okay? But it could be iron and sulfur, right? So those are basically so, things so that... It's a combination of yeah, things. Yeah, combination But there's always that. iron. There's always iron yeah. involved in... in and this, this piece of material, whatever it is, has to be charged at somewhere somewhere yeah. along the line yeah. to have the magnetism. Yeah. How, do, how do these magnetic objects well, get charged? It's basically the atomic structure, right, of the combination of oxygen and iron ah. that actually produce this uh, uh, atomic combination that uh, is actually uh, carrying the magnetism of some of this material. And how long does, you know, a piece of material from way back when, from paleo days, how long does it keep that charge? Billions of years. Really? Right, so you, it depends upon the, the grain sizes, you know, how small these magnetic domains are. If you have very, very small type of uh, sizes, these are called super paramagnetic, and the magnetism is, you know, there is some sort of a short term. But when you're talking about other materials that have a different type of uh, magnetic grain sizes, single domain, multi-domain, pseudo-single domain, then you're talking about uh, relaxation times of billions of years. This is a very good question because, for example, all the oceanic crust of the Earth, of the planet, is, you know, carries magnetism. And how long is it going to be the magnetism actually holding there, right? So that you're talking about in this particular case, because of that magnetic grain sizes, or those magnetic grain sizes of these particles, that they will be there for billions of years. 
Well, are they ever there, like forever, for infinity? <laughs> In other words, they, they <laughs> never deteriorate. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. They yes. They always course, deteriorate. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they suffer. For example, a, a low temperature uh, oxidation. Uh, some others they suffer what is called a uh, high temperature oxidation. That's one of the things. But in, compared to our lifetime, right? Like, you know, the human being, yeah. you know, we live up to maybe 78, 80. My dad uh, died a couple of years ago, and he was 98 when he died. This is basically the historic time that people relate to when you're talking about how old is old. So 100 years compared to 4 billion years, you're talking about you know a tremendous amount of time, right? That's essentially so, one of the scales. Now I can I can read magnetism. Yes. What do I need to read magnetism in a given object? Well, you need to actually uh, take that particular type of material, and when we're talking about materials, we're talking about, for example, the hard drive of, okay. your, of your computer. Sure. Sure. Right? You can. It's actually, not going to last a billion years. I'm uh, telling you now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, so you can have the hard drive of your, of, your, of your computer, but you can also have other things like, for example, a biomagnet, right? What is a biomagnet? It's a bacteria that, you know, can actually swim from one polarity to another polarity, for example. Uh, you can have a, uh, a rock. How do you read it? You have a machine, you know, that scans things and tells you how much magnets yeah, are Yeah, you basically, what you do with these kind of things, you have some measuring devices. This is basically what one of the things that we're trying to do today in the 21st century, that uh, we know the magnetism is there, it has been there for many years, but also the techniques of actually reading the, that signal coming from these objects, now they have improved so much that we have now instruments that can go and measure things like, for example, the magnetism of our hair, right? We're talking about a hair, basically you're talking about 60 micrometers. Has so magnetism? It, it could. It could be. Well, this suggests that a, a magnetic charge is essentially a storage device, like for energy. Exactly. Yes. So you could, if you could, if you could figure out how to take something that will take a lot of energy, and you could charge that up, you have a, a battery yeah, that could be we, very we, efficient. Yeah, we're not talking about energy, but you know, when you actually try to decipher the past history of the Earth, then you have to go to rocks because the history of the rocks is basically recorded by the rocks in the oceanic crust. Okay. So we're talking about going, you know, for the present configuration of the continents, we're talking about you can go back 180 million years, right? Just Give or take. The, right, so 100, more or less 180 <laughs> billion, million years. But if you actually try to understand how the continental masses have been actually placed, you know, these paleogeographic reconstructions, then you can go to probably 1.5 billion years or even longer okay. than that. Let me shift to Carl. Yeah. Because we only have a few minutes left in this segment. Carl, I, I assume that you know at least a fair part of what Emilio knows about this subject. Yeah? Well, I just and thought. If, and if you're wrong, he can correct you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, I, I really had an awakening when I took this class to uh, it's. I've already noticed in other classes that I'm. Uh, kind of using it to solve problems. Uh, it's just another tool uh, for the geologist. Geologist, but you know, you're talking before about biomagnetism. That's not geology, is it? That's chemistry. Hmm? No, not really. I mean, it's a, it's a subfield of magnetism. That's yeah. basically what we're talking but about. But I mean, what, what that suggests to me, and this may be outside the notion of um, paleomagnetism, of course, but is that the, the magnetic charge in your hair or in the other parts of your your biome, so to speak, um, ha have an effect on you. They're not operating in a in a vacuum. They have the the charge in your hair may have an effect on your skin or some other organ, and so um, there is a biological a phenomenon yeah, happening here, right? which I don't know if that's within your science, but it sounds very interesting to be able to see relationships of, of pieces of your biology in terms of magnetic effect, cause and effect. Yeah, well, uh, there are several, uh, let's say, uh, chapters of this biomagnetic type of uh, understanding and knowledge. One of the things we are doing in our class, for example, is to understand uh, how we get, for example, some of the magnetic particles that are in the environment in the lower part of our lungs. 
or in the middle part of our brain. Is that good for you? Uh, no, no, on the contrary, or <laughs> our brain. So one of the things that we actually we are studying in, the, in our class and the laboratory is that, for example, we need to take samples of the tailpipe of our car, right? And you say, how? Well, you know, you can dust off, you know, a tailpipe, or you can get, for example, a, a toilet paper, you know, that type of tissue, and you go, go there and try to um, get some of these magnetic particles onto the paper, right? So what you do with this kind of thing, you go to the laboratory and you measure, you know, the, supposedly the magnetism of these particles. And we have done that, and it's amazing because there is a very strong magnetic signal coming from these things. Carl, you've been working with this too. You're yeah, nodding your head the, and it sounds like this is something in the The class. environmental magnetism, and that's kind of where the link is with uh, the human body and, and um, the geology side because we're using the exact same equipment that we process you know, rock samples with, but instead, in this regard, we're looking at brake pad dust, we're looking at your exhaust, um, even stuff that your vacuum cleaner picks up because this is all basically magnetic pollution that you don't realize because that brake pad just disappears as you drive. And no one thinks a thing of it. What's magnetic? Just, just for the record, what is magnetic pollution? Well, okay. <laughs> so, okay, this is a very good question because the, what, the other thing that happens is that people do not really realize that we have, for example, the air conditioning here. So there are particles that are actually raining on our heads, right, because of the entire air conditioning system yeah. of, the, of, of the building. Yeah. And then, then we have to go with the size of these particles. So we have, you know, uh, very small particles, right, like viruses, bacteria, and many other things. A, a, a virus or a bacteria could actually have a charge? They could have a charge. And they, 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 well, I'm going to go back to the, what Carl was saying about the brakes. So what basically, basically happens is that you go there, pick up some of these pieces from the tailpipe or your uh, brakes, you know, the brake pads, and then you go to the, to the instruments and you measure the magnetism of these kind of things, even though they are very, very small. You know, you're talking about a hair. The diameter of hair is about 60 micrometers, but they are something called PM, particular matter. This is about 10 and then 2.5. So these kind of things, they go up in the atmosphere. You know, the cars are actually expelling that kind of stuff. And you're gonna say, where are they coming from? They are coming from the engine that is breaking down. I love this. This right? is great. Yeah. We live in a world of magnetism. <laughs> yes. I suppose you can see the whole thing in terms of magnetism. I suppose this class has changed your way of lo looking at things, Carl? Yes, yeah. Um, and it, it really kind of baffles you when you step back and you realize that a brand new set of tires has like an extra half inch of tread on it and you don't think a thing of it and you get a new set of tires. And then when you start looking at how much rubber that is, it's, it's incredible how much stuff just you don't even think of. Uh, Does this suggest that you could have a sort of magnetic signature, that, that you know an object would be unique for the, the way its magnetic field works and the, the particles in it and the, you know, so the, the, the configuration of those particles, the effects, so that you can, you can say based on a magnetic signature, this object is different from all the other objects in the world and I can look at it magnetically. Uh, in, in, uh, indirectly, yes, you can uh, you can do that. But the, back one of the things that we are trying to do is basically study the the magnetic grain sizes or these kind of things from the engine. Yeah. And when you determine that there is magnetism in these tiny tiny particles, what I happens? I know what happens. I know what happens. What happens? You take a break. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, thank you for being with us. Thank you. That's uh, Carl, let me say this right, Gersnecker? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, who is a student, a master's student in, uh, in geoscience at HIGP. Don't get up, we're not done yet. What's <laughs> okay, up? that's Emil, Emilio Herrera Bervera, and he is going to be with us in the next segment. So he's going to put his microphone back on right after this break.
Oh, we're back. <laughs> what an exciting show this is. Okay, we have additional guests now. Uh, we have, uh, to Emilio's left, uh, Vanessa Lopez. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. And we have uh, Brian Seeley. Swilly. Swilly. Okay, also from uh, SOAS, the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology, and HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planet. Why? What are you guys doing there anyway, just so we can compare you with Carl? Oh, I'm a student, uh, I'm an undergraduate student of geophysics, and I've taken Emilio's class to learn more about paleomagnetism and, and the, the effects of magnetism on the Earth and the human body. That was introduced to me at the beginning of the class. As you spoke earlier, we were talking about uh, the, the biomagnetism within our bodies that we have been working on, and it's really interesting. You know, this is something working I'm in that area, working in that area. Learning about that. Vanessa, what about you? I'm doing the same thing. I'm an undergrad in geology and geophysics, and I'm really excited about telemagnetism. So is, uh, that excitement that you both seem to have, um, is that going to lead to a graduate degree in geophysics? Are you writing this down, Emilio? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you may know him a long time. <laughs> is, are you going to be doing geophysics in your graduate work? Yes. Yeah. Planning on doing research about it? Yeah, yeah. So is this a class for undergraduates you're talking about? Uh, it, or, it is or? a class that is uh, classified as GG, Geology and Geophysics 651. Mm -hmm. But both undergraduates and graduate students actually take it. Oh, in the same class? Yes. Yeah. There is another student that is not here. I don't know why. He probably couldn't make it. But that student uh, and Carl, they are graduate students. And these two students are undergraduate students. Uh -huh. okay. But I, I have to say something here also yeah. in addition to this kind of thing. We're not only studying this type of environmental magnetism. We are actually studying rocks. You know, we are actually uh, drilling a section at Makapu Point. And basically the idea is to determine how the magnetic field of the Earth is actually changing. Okay, can we talk about past. that? Yes. Okay, so we have a rock. I give you a rock, Emilio. <laughs> and you have your special things that, that, that can tell the magnetism in the, mm, I guess, the, the molecules of the rock or the atoms, whatever it is in the rock. Yeah. And you can get a whole picture of the rock, a map, if you will, of the rock and the magnetism and all this. Uh, more or less. Uh, how do you get from there to, to uh, paleo magnetism? Okay, essentially what you basically let me tell you the, the background of this kind of thing. Um, I wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation. Mm. The proposal basically was to study one of the sections of the Koala volcano. The Koala volcano was like this, right? And basically, one of the reasons why this uh, flank of the volcano collapsed and went into the ocean is because of the steepness of the lavas. You know, they're very steep. They were erupted very fast. And then there's a lot of uh, dikes injected into the system, and then the volcano, the, the volcano collapsed. Yeah. And the pieces of the volcano are out there. They travel about 250 kilometers in one shot. So this actually creates a very unique condition, because once the volcano is collapsed, then you have the innards of the volcano exposed, like, for example, at Macapu Point. Yeah. If you go to Macapu Point, you stand up there, you say, well, it looks like that part of the volcano is actually missing. Yeah. But the beauty of that kind of thing is it is actually leaving the, the lavas, you know, the inside of the volcano, right there exposed. So those lavas are ideal for sampling because you have them there. Right there, it's like a pancake, one after another one. So, how, so you take Makapu or, or the volcano bigger. So, what, so you, you have to look at samples of rocks from various places in the structure. Well, let me let me explain about that. Yeah, yeah. What, what basically happens? I told the students, okay, why don't we just go there, all of us? Yeah. And I have a portable drill. It's yeah. a rock drill. Yeah. Right. So we go to the lowest lava flow. You know, the one at sea level. Yeah. And then we have to actually take samples with the rock drill. You gotta take about at least ten of these sa samples. Okay. Not very big. No, they it's are it's just it's basically it's one inch. Just one inch. One inch, and the the length of them is about two or three inches. And they're lava. They lava lava yeah. pe uh, 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 sample. You yeah. cut them off. Yeah. Then you take them to the laboratory before yeah. you actually take them out of the outcrop. Yeah. You have to mark them, you know, with the orientation relative yeah. to You guys to doing this? Yes. yes. No, we, we have done there. it. Yeah. We've done we it. already did that. Okay. Already well, done it. Well, we are in the Were process. Are you working with the tailpipes too? Yes. Okay, tailpipes and lava. I got it. Tailpipes, brakes, <laughs> you know, and then lavas. And, the, and, right? uh, and uh, the residue from that I vacuumed out of my room for the 
for that bi biological matter. So yes. Yeah, those all. kind of things that he's talking about, they are very important because people don't realize that when you have here, for example, this carpet, it is full of all these bacteria and viruses that came from the air conditioning. Yeah. And you have them there, and you are actually putting them in our system. Yeah, you spoke uh, of environmental maggots. Is that what you mean yes, by environment that's right, yes, right. all around us? Yes. But going back to the rocks, right, so you take about 10 of these samples because you have to have some sort of statistics done on them so you can calculate the mean declination and inclination and the intensity. It is a, it's a, it's a vector. So you take these samples, you cut them off, and you take them to the laboratory, and then you measure the magnetism in them of each one of them. Yeah, but okay. don't you lose a lot of information uh, when you take them from different places and you don't remember exactly where you took them from? No, 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 no. <laughs> There's not such a thing. I mean, you, I you go to the field, you have a notebook, right? And you write down, okay, this is lava flow number one, sample one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then you move up. You know, so to you the know next pretty much where they yeah, came from. To the, 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 to, to the next lava flow, you can even take a picture. The separation or the, the distance between the first lava flow and the second lava flow it could be two or three meters, or could be you know the adjacent lava flow up on top of this one. So you do this kind of thing. You take all these kind of things yeah. in the laboratory. Yeah. You measure the magnetism. Yeah. The idea basically is you measure the, the, the magnetism of this lava flow, that one, that one, that one, that yeah. one. I can tell you right now, from the uh, sea level, you know, uh, part of the, of the section, to the top, you know, there is a lighthouse if you go to Makapu. Yeah. We're talking about 200 meters in terms of the vertical distance. Yeah. There are about 400 lava flows that were erupted by the volcano. Over time. Over time. Okay, but there is another component that is extremely important. We have this pancake, right, so determine the magnetism, but then there is a friend of mine, he is from Wisconsin, and they have a laboratory where they, they can tell you the date, of the, the timing of the emplacement of the rock. From you, the magnetism? No, they are using argon-argon isotopes. Okay, then another system altogether, another way of reading uh, the rock. This is basically what it's so called. So now I know the magnetism thing. and you know I the know magnetism the magnetism and the, the, the age. So what do I, what do, I do with okay, all that? Okay, you, you have all these kind of things, and now I need to know how the Earth's magnetic field is actually changing over time, right? Is it going from a normal polarity to a reverse polarity, normal to intermediate type of uh, configuration of the field to a reverse? Okay. So would you reconstruct the past history of that particular section? Okay, Let and me, then, I'm gonna go to your students now. He's a great teacher, by the way. <laughs> I wanna join your class. So <clears throat> now you have, you have the dating, mm -hmm. and you have the magnetism, um, and you have it all, in a place somewhere, maybe on a website or a, sh a spreadsheet. Uh, what is that going to, and you, and you can figure out how it's degrading, the magnetism is degrading or changing no, over time? They, no, not degrading, what we do is we, changing. We, changing. Changing, okay. Changing. What so, we do is we take so these samples and we go so back. So what is the aha moment in all of this? I'm asking them. Yeah. And, and you don't have to grade them on this, okay? No, no. But unless you want to. No, no. Okay, all right. So what we, what we do is we go back and we, we grind up particles and we can check for the Curie points to check to see if we have magnetite in, in them, the pure magnetite. What is magnetite? It is a magnetic particle that is found in, in all rocks. Okay. It's a magnetic mineral. Yeah. Mineral, I mean, okay. my apologies. And yeah. it's also found in, in animals. In their, in their brains. Like you can take a human being and... Bodies. So, I mean, human bodies. Yes. So. But it's in animals, and that's what allows them to naturally turn to the north yeah. and be able to migrate. So, Vanessa, how much of what he said do you agree with? <laughs> More or less. <laughs> but back to your question, we correlate to the uh, uh, magnetic chronostatigraphy. So we will be able to tell in the geological time scale. We can relate the... So what's the paper on this? I'm going to write for the journal Science. What's, what's my what's the topic? Okay. What's the article that I want to write here? Yeah, the, the article that we're going to be actually there is one. Okay, oh, no, no, all right. No. There's there, there will be one. one. No, 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 no. So. Let me tell you something. We have the grant from the National Science Foundation, and the number one priority and our obligation is to produce in writing the results. Remember one thing, and they know that it is not science until it's published. So you, you, you know, because if I ask you or any one of you, what is this, and then you tell me, you know, that, that doesn't have any any meaning, right? But if we actually publish the results, 
of our research, then it's, that it's, is it's, it's there forever, right? And so all that. then, yeah, that's yeah, all right. Yeah, so yeah. the idea basically is that you go see how these things are changing, and I can tell you one thing. Uh, many years ago, you know, I, I was trying to investigate the magnetic field of the Earth in that place, and I told the students. So we thought that the age of the Makapu section was 1.8 million years old. That yeah. means the lava flows were erupted at 1.8. And, and, and layers. So yeah, and layers, right? Yeah. So there was, they, they took a, a sample from the lava flow. Yeah. Now, going to the, from the bottom of the, of the section to the top, and we took several you know, uh, uh, samples for radiometric dating, we came up with ages that they were totally, completely older with respect to what it was reported in the literature. So our ultimate goal of this is to do the magnetics and then the dating so we can actually tell, you know, how many reversals, if any. So you get a sort of dynamic picture of how you, this yes, land was right. created. Uh, well, that basically, th that's another aspect of, the, uh, of this research, right? So yes. what we need oh, to do okay. is to understand the growth the evolution of Hawaiian volcanoes. Yeah. Once we write the paper, yeah. you know, it's going to revolutionize the understanding of the growth of the volcanoes here in Hawaii because the Makapu section, yeah. it is not 1.8 million years old, but it's older. Wow. You know, at nine meters from, this, from sea level, the age is 2.61. So that means that the bottom of the section is even older than that. So now we know that the Koala volcano from sea level going all the way to the top is about the history of uh, uh, recorded of the magnetic field, coupling with the uh, radiometric dating, we're talking about 400,000 years of eruptions. Okay, uh, Brian, can you summarize the show for me, if you don't mind? Summarize well, the show. What do we learn here today? What we learned here today is the fact that <laughs> the, the volcanoes here on, on the Hawaiian Islands are older than they are, and that the uh, Earth's magnetic field has been migrating over a period of the existence here, that it's been around, and also that there's a lot of magnetic pollution in the in the environment that we don't pay much attention to that's killing us. That's the most interesting thing to me. It's not just Makapu. It's my it's my lungs. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> that's no, no, but, but let me tell you something. We can go one step further. It has been found yeah. that in the brain yeah. of, of human beings, yeah. we have some of these tiny, teeny particles. Yeah. The size of and the of And the they're brain. damaging. Well, I, uh, there is a very recent paper saying that there is a direct relationship between the magnetic green sizes of these particles and Alzheimer's disease. Okay, we got to go. But Vanessa, I wanted to ask you, what do you think of Emilio as your, your teacher? What, 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 he's a great teacher. He's a great yeah. teacher? Yeah. Yeah. teacher? Well, he's a great, a great guest here in the, in the show, I can tell you that. Well, thank you very much, Emilio, Vanessa, uh, Brian, and Carl was here a little, a little while ago. It really is a, a mind-boggling mind for, thing what for, you're doing. For, for having us here. It opens here. all kinds of new thoughts yes. in, in my mind, anyway. Thank you so much, thank you guys. You. Thank, thank you. you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>